Hey folks, welcome back to The Pulse. My name is Matt, the script of Heartbeat. It's actually right side up with Steve Staggs. That's what we're really doing here. But folks, it's great to have you here. This is episode 31, so now you, you finally have achieved and leveled up so that you can watch two hours of Steve Staggs every single day of any month you decide to do, right? So you could choose a month that has 31 days, and every single day you could spend two hours with me and Steve Staggs if you wanted to. That would be, that sounds like torture in some respects, but folks, it's great to have you back. There's some great people here, but I'm just, uh, I'm excited because we're going to be talking about artificial intelligence and we're going to talk about real intelligence too in the whole process. Hopefully, hopefully we will, hopefully we'll represent real intelligence, but of course the reason he came and the reason I came is because of this guy, Steve Staggs. What's up, Steve? Hey dude, how you be? I'm good. You're looking good. You're looking healthy. Well, thank you. I mean, that, I think that's part, at least one of the goals. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're doing well. You're looking good. Yeah. Are you looking forward to the, the Christmas time with grandkids and, and family and such? Yeah, I have this great privilege. Probably a lot of men do. I have this outstanding wife who is incredibly gifted at being able to do a lot of things <laughs> and so and she loves doing them so i get to kind of kick back and enjoy the holidays with family and all of that stuff while she goes out and puts all the stuff together and so i have a great time doing what i'm good at which is enjoying stuff and she has a great time doing what she does which is putting it all together so it's a good combination so we're looking yeah. forward to it well, it's nice to have roles in in, yeah. in the, the defined roles and people actually enjoy their role yeah. and are like, Steve, get out of the kitchen or get out of this thing. Like, get away, go do something else. Yeah. And I, I I like that, actually, because it's it's like a teamwork thing. And that's I find that that is helpful. I, I was raised in a traditional role family. It sounds like you have that as well. I've got that as well. And I enjoy that as myself. Yeah, we we have really tried over the years to um, maintain that because, as all of us know, uh, there virtually everything that is happening in the modern life is designed to pull the family apart. Yeah, and that's not a philosophical or moral or traditional comment. It's just the reality of it. Yeah, and so like when our kids were growing up. Um, we always made sure that we had, you know, family dinner, sitting down. Well, guess whose house was the favorite house in every community we lived in during dinner time? The stags. Yeah, <laughs> because there, almost every every night we would let one of you know one of our children invite one of their friends over who loved it, and so you know that was a big deal coming, you know, coming to our house for dinner always my wife always had cookies and things like that for the kids and they would yeah. come. i mean it was one uh, just a stream of kids all the time just because we sat down and had dinner together yeah what a i mean doggone if that is not you know the picture of simple some the simplicity of success in a family i just don't know what is you know, one one day, Steve, I hope to to have a dinner with uh, with you and your wife, and you know, have some perhaps red wine and red meat. Oh and yeah. Then perhaps retreat somewhere for a long conversation over perhaps a single malt scotch or bourbon. <laughs> I would. Hey, you set the date, and um, you're there. <laughs> Heaven and earth are going to have to get out of the way because we're yeah. we're going to show up. <laughs> wow, we'll, we'll have to get David Lee and Sam Kemp and Mike Ostel. We'll have to get the whole crew together. Yeah, it's it. It would be wonderful to to visit. You know, there's something about that around the holiday time. I think I long for that. Yeah. And of course, you you know, you're a grandfather. I hope to be at some point a grandfather. And there is that stability. And when you say the kids loved being at your house, I mean. Yeah. You know, creating that environment of um, peace, number one, and two, also a place where you feel like somebody actually is interested in you. I like that dynamic, right? Because yeah. that was the thing that it, we've all, I think, hopefully people have had in their lives somebody that was, you know, genuinely interested in them. And I have a feeling that the reason that people and the kids liked being there is they felt very welcome. 
Well, they were, and not only were they welcome, we were incredibly interested in them. And what, what's interesting that happens just by the simple thing of inviting them into your home to sit down and talk and be a part of your family, they will eventually start confiding in you and asking you for input and, and then giving you permission to speak into their lives. Yeah. And so we had something we called powwows. Okay. And so if there was an issue going on, um, you know, kid would come over and, you know, and I could tell something was going on or they were getting involved in something. And I'd say, hey, uh, why don't you come over and we'll have a powwow? Mm. And they'd, they'd say, sure, Mr. Staggs, when do you want to do that? And I said, you pick the time. Yeah. We'll just go take a walk and we'll have a powwow. And we would do that as in, with individual kids. We'd also do it as group, you know, as group of kids. Hmm. And the thing is, is they invited you into, in this case, me, they would invite me into their world to speak into their lives. And it wasn't that I was trying to tell any, you know, tell them how to live. They just knew there was somebody who was looking out for them to protect them, that they, that they knew it was a safe place to be. Yeah. And it's powerful. I mean, it's so powerful. And yeah. you know what? And you're, you're continuing to model that behavior with me as well as like, you're interested, right? Yeah. You're not, you're not, you're not first interesting. You're mm. interested. You said, Hey, I'm interested. And then, Hey, are you open to this? You know, yeah. are you interested in hearing some alternative view? I think you've said that many, many times. Hey, let me share with you some, a, a different way of looking at this and all rooted in Jesus being alive and speaking, which is fantastic. Yeah. But you know, let's have our virtual powwow today. Steve. <laughs> right let's, let's, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it with Mike Ostell. He walks with me and he talks with me. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. Good morning, uh, Steve and Matt and all of you truth seekers. It's it's fun to do things in this format here. Um, Quinn's here. What's up, Quinn? Hey, what's it's up, so Quinn? good to have you. Um, Hexonium is here. And of course... The legend of David Lee, all the way from southwestern Indiana. He's here. And Crypto Pez, you know, coming in from Spain. Uh, even and all, great to get another two hours of holy hopium. I love that. <laughs> Thanks for keeping this going. Crypto Pez, thank you for, for doing this. It's cool to have, you know, I imagine people and where they're at, right? And I always know you're you're in Spain. And I'm like, what's it like in Spain? And yeah. what time is it in Spain? It's got to be like 6, 7 p.m., and it's cool. It's really neat that people would tune in from around the world just to listen to a couple guys yak uh, about Jesus. So thank you for being here. Um, Hexonium says there are angels and demons. You just have to choose. Counsel comes from heaven. You know, no, no more truth spoken there. there that's yeah. going to be a big topic of this. Actually, yeah. we talked about, you know, who, who are you? Um, Who's paying your wages? Maybe that'll be a part of what we'll talk about today. Yeah. Uh, Sam Kemp is here. Um, just dropping in for now. Absolute tracking down candidates. Good for you. Big stuff happening in the Texas nationalist movement and stuff with uh, Texas. Oh, he's in, he's in McKinney. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's right near That's right near us. Not far yeah. from you. Yeah. About um, 10 miles away. Rich Liberation. Good to see you. Um, <laughs> Sam's in. He's like, oh, I'll... Uh, <laughs> I'll have some red meat, some red wine, and some bourbon with you. <laughs> Fantastic, you know. And actually, what, what a what a wonderful, wouldn't that be great? You know, I think about meetups and all that stuff. We ought to do that. We ought to have like the the Texan meetup, and then we ought to uh, throw in a little bonus for those who want to, you know, squirrel away. Um, that's good. Um, Mike Ostell says, uh, torture me with single malt three years after I gave up alcohol. But I would love the fellowship. Absolutely. And you know what? Sometimes, you know, I'm, I can't handle much myself. It just for a lot of reasons, you know, old man reasons. I love, um, I love smoking a pipe and drinking coffee black. Oh, that combination cool. is really, really good. I'm not a cigar guy at all, huh. but I do, I do enjoy that. Um, Identity Block is here. Dude, thanks so much. It's so great. Identity Block has been like in everything I've been doing here in the last uh, like month or so. And I just really appreciate that. Um, Element Hex, welcome. Welcome. Hello, Matt and Steve. Hello. Um, well, cool. Well, we're going to talk about AI 
today, oh, wow. Steve. Yeah. And so I, uh, I had an experience that I wanted to throw at you because one of the coolest things that I've learned, and I've got this whole list of things I've learned from Steve and have been reinforced within 72 hours by Jesus himself. <laughs> um, but one of the things that I, I learned in all of this is that the tools are neutral. Yeah. And so before we get into things, you know, AI right now, if we boil it down, how do I use AI and what's happening in the world of AI? Um, it's a tool. Yeah. You know, one of the ways I use it is I'll write a letter or I'll write an email or I'll write something that I want to communicate. And the cool thing about it is I can do that in a text stream, right? So chat GPT, let's say I use. And I'll say, I'll say, help me write this more clearly. And what's interesting is I've done that so much that you can start having this kind of conversation where you're getting um, consistency in the way that it's writing. And when I look at it, I'm like, it didn't change what I wanted to say, but I just know the spellings correct, the punctuation. And it, you know, it did reword this in a way that's is a, that's a better way of saying it, you know, because I've got a run on sentence here or there. Well, that's very minor comparatively to what is, you know, capable of doing. Um, but I, I met a guy who was really, really into AI and is really knowledgeable about it. And there's a big spectrum here. There's a there's a group of people who are like, you know, this is going to be like Terminator and AI is going to take over and kill everybody. Right. So that's one end of the spectrum. And then there's the other end of the spectrum that says, hey, we're going to have access to uh, this, you know, multi end point tool where you can engage with it in a lot of different ways and you could get access to things. And the implications of that are really significant. Um, because if you think about how the human brain works is we take in information and we essentially distill it down. And if you think about, you know, let's imagine you're a doctor and you go to school for 12 some odd years memorizing all this stuff, doing all these things, having clinical stuff and everything. Next thing you know, you're on your own and somebody comes in, they got a bullet hole in them. Well, mm. that condensing is what your brain has done to say, all right, what do we do to get through this? Yeah. And, you know, they're obviously have built these systems to be very similar, but at the end of the day, you know, the approach that you take is essentially this animation. And so, I wanted to set it up there, but will you talk about that, you know, to, I think is a bit of a review is this idea of tools being animated. Cause I think that's going to be the, the underlying theme here is that, you know, AI provided that it's not, you know, sentient is a tool. Yeah. Do you see it that way? Uh, absolutely. I mean, it, I mean, if we think about it from a macro standpoint, what is the purpose to a tool? Well, um, there's this fundamental concept that, that uh, time is the model for capacity. You know, to increase capacity, you have to first increase capability. And so the, one of the ways of envisioning or thinking about that is if I was given the job to dig a hole and all I had were my hands, well, my hands are, you know, are my tool. They are my device of use of service at that point. And so whatever period of time, my hands are only going to be able to produce so much because their capacity, the capacity of my hands as a tool is limited. And so I can dig and dig and dig. And so I look down there, my hands are all, you know, beat up and chewed up and I've only got, you know, a three by three pile of dirt in there and I've been working for 10 hours and I'm going, man, there's got to be a better way of doing this. Yeah. Tools as hands, I appreciate you as my tools of service, but there's a better way of doing this. So now I've got to increase my capability. And so what is, a, what is a way to increase my capability if I, Say, hey, at this rate, at a three by three pile, I'll be here for 25 years to get the job done. So what is it that I can do to, you know, to increase my capacity? Oh, I got to increase first my capability. Ah, 
let's do this. Oh, let's see, how will I do that? What are some of the ways I could do that? The guy says, oh, I know what to do with that. So he says, I'm going to build another kind of tool. I'm going to call it a shovel. And now when I use that shovel, not only am I limited, to, now not only can I use my hands at a, in a different level that increases my capability to increase capacity, but now I can also use my feet and my legs. Well, that all works great as long as, you know, in the use of, you know, toward achieving the mission. Now, if I am dedicated to achieving the mission uh, and to achieve also the purpose of the mission, which is good, I can also then take that tool, whether it be my hands or that shovel, and I can turn it for evil. Well, how can I do that? Well, I can start holding people hostage to the use of the tool. I can use the tool as a way to extract from others what is precious and needful for them so that I can have it. Um, I can take that tool and I can bash it over somebody's head because they're not complying to my requirements. The tool doesn't care in the sense of the use of the tool, it is simply a mechanism of service. The hands, the feet, everything, the body that's in motion is a, is a mechanism, is a tool of service that is then using the tool of service called a shovel in this instance to then convert it from something of good that adds value to the human family to something that then as used as a weapon to extract from the human family the things that are valuable to them. Now, what is it that creates that change? Is it the tool? No. Nope. No, it's the one using the tool. Right. And the one using the tool is motivated by, and by utilizing, our word is animating the tool to accomplish a selfish, selfish purpose and intention that it that exploits other for the purpose of benefiting me. Yep. Well, the tool is innocent in the matter. Okay? It's either going to be an instrument of service that provides benefit and blessing, or it's going to be an instrument of service that's going to provide exploitation. Um, and man. Just, I don't know any other word, but evil. Yeah. See? Um, and it all depends on the one using it. Yep. Well, well and that's the theme. It goes everywhere. It does. It, and, and that is such a big idea that I don't know if everyone has related to. And it seems so, you made it so simple, right? So you've used the term, uh, you know, a gun sitting on a table would sit there forever. And now you're, you're talking about a shovel. And I think it's really good to start at a very, very understandable base layer. You're like, your hands you could dig, but here's a shovel. Well, what is a shovel but a lever? I and mean, if you think about it, it has a bend in it for a reason. Yeah. And we can leverage ourselves, our weight. And But you're right. If you keep it that simple and say, you know, I could, you know, I could hit someone over the head with this. And I could use it as a weapon. I'm going to use it as a means of tilling the soil to bring, you know, value. And so let's, let's talk about the big rocks of all of this, because we're talking about tools of AI. The secondary piece of this too, is we talk a lot over the last 30 episodes about the nature and character of how you animate. Yeah. So, so one of the things it's like, okay, I see this kind of good and evil thing. But then also I have this kind of separate thing, which I would consider to be self, right? So I'm going to give an illustration. I want you to dissect these and help me with this. Okay. There's people in crypto who are influencers and they use the tool of streaming and video, making videos on YouTube. And they have somebody that pays them, right? But they don't tell their audience that they're getting paid. And they shill something because they're getting paid, but they present it as if... It's something that they're, you know, they're, they're, they're shilling it and it's really a manipulation, right? So rather than hitting you over the head with a, a weapon, 
they're withholding information and manipulating essentially those that are viewing, right? So taking advantage of people by, you know, convincing them to do something. Um, and it doesn't have integrity. It's not true. And it's not always the case, but yeah. there's a lot of this that's going on. You know, it's easy for me to see, Steve, like shooting the gun at someone, right? And, and you know, or, or digging a hole or, you know, or in using a, a, a shovel as a weapon. I get that difference, right? Yeah. But there's a lot of kind of gray area in the middle, too, which is... You know, I'm not actually, you know, killing you with this, but I am not, my intent is not pure. Yeah. Um, so if, for example, there's kind of, let's say, on this extreme end, there's the, those who have aligned themselves with evil forces, literally, right? Literally, like sold their soul to the devil and are accomplishing and doing his will and listening to him. And then you got the opposite end of the spectrum of people listening to Jesus and saying, hey, I want to animate this tool in your nature and character. And then there's kind of this person that's in the middle who is self. Yeah. I feel like they're just like, hey, I'm just trying to make it here. I'm not real considerate of other people and I'll do whatever I can do. And it's not like this conscious thing like the devil made me do it. It's more of like, no, this is the way things do. I got to get mine. Yeah. Help me dissect the distance between those and how to see those. And maybe they're not three things, but they seem like there's a gradient. So go. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our telephone conversation. Yeah, no, Steve. <laughs> Dance monkey. Yeah. Right. Um, well, in the, in the, uh, in the caricature of the, of the rocks. Okay. Let's keep it at yeah. a rock level. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, Jesus gave me a term for business many years ago that um, in four words captures it all. Okay. And those four words are truth in the transaction. Now think about that for a second. Truth in the transaction. Okay. Uh, a lot of people have asked me or then set out when they hear that um, to say, well, what is truth? Pilate asks Jesus, what is truth? Right? A lot of us will say, what is truth? And because we want to define it. And what I have said to them and our friend Carter, you know, really worked, this worked him over for some period of time. You know, and it was, well, I don't have to define truth. Everybody already knows what it is by virtue of what it isn't. So you have mentioned a lot of time on your streams, for example, you have a very high sensitivity when somebody is trying to play you. Yep. Well, do you have to define what it is to be played? No, you would, get a, yeah, you get a sense yeah, of it. You get a sense. I would just offer is because you know that it, there's not truth coming at you. Yeah, good point. Whatever it is, it's not truth. Whatever truth is defined as, that ain't it. What that is that's coming at me is something that is trying to play me. It's trying to maneuver me, trying to manipulate me, and it doesn't matter there can be a thousand different mechanisms or tactics or techniques used, but every one of them has at its core utilization, the animating element of playing me. Yeah. Okay. So at the big rock level, uh, devices are neutral. Money is a device. It is an outstanding tool to help make our trade efficient, seamless, simple, quantifiable, you know, 
It's a fabulous tool. And when there is truth in the transaction, when we exchange whatever we exchange, and we may not have a single spiritual thought or single evil good thought in our mind in that exchange, but we know there is this truth in it, whether it's integrity or satisfaction, doesn't matter what it is, we both know that neither of us are trying to exploit each other. Our trade is good. What you have, I need or desire. And what I have, you need or desire. And we make that change, that exchange. One of the elements that makes that efficient and easy is this thing called money. And so we make that exchange. Truth in the transaction. I'm not exploiting you. You're not exploiting me. What you have, I need or desire. What I have, you need or desire. And between the two of us, we are totally satisfied in the reciprocation of our exchange and intentions toward one another. Truth in the transaction. Yep. Okay. Well, you don't have to have a spiritual context to understand that. Right. You don't have to know a, a single thing, whether, you know, what the devil is doing or what is G what Jesus is doing or what the man in the moon is doing. You as an individual recognize that and your senses are clean, are keen to it. Yeah. Okay. Money is neutral, but takes the form of the person who owns it. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's it. That's it. So now let's go to your example of, of the person who is uh, promoting something. And I'm going to put use different words to make sure I've got what you're saying. They're promoting something as useful and valuable and something that people need when they no more believe that in the man on the moon. The only thing they're really interested is the extraction of money that is gained as a result of promoting that good or service. They will say it's good but they don't believe it's good. Um, they will say it's necessary and important, but they don't believe it's necessary and important. Well, what are they doing? There's not truth in the transaction. And it, it's, the issue is not whether the good or service actually has value. It is the animating force behind the promotion of that good or service. And so then you have to make the decision. Is that the kind of person I want to do business with? Because I, ha I have no sense of truth in this transaction. They're just playing me using your words. Days gone by, I used to talk to, you know, to sales groups and marketing groups, and they would want to know all of these, you know, they were technique driven. And you and your audience ought to know by now that techniques to me are just tools. Yeah. They're devices. They're neutral. What I'm always interested in is the animating force that's behind it. And so I would say to them by way of example, which now coming full circle to your, to your illustration, um, if you want to sell, first serve. Yeah. Serve to sell. Mm-hmm. If you serve in your selling, they will come back and demand from you to sell them more. Just serve them in your selling. Yep. Well, and it's it speaks to authenticity. Yep. And and you know it's interesting. I was watching um, this conflict on display. I was watching an interview from after. I think it was 46 47 something like that and it was oppenheimer reflecting upon what he had and you could tell a very troubled man who you know went along with his program i mean it took a long time for the manhattan project to get up and running and what they did in new mexico and how people you know enriching uranium across the country and you know all of the things that had to come together um of course there's a you know a big movie made about it recently um but this this you know ultimate you know tool right mm -hmm. this ultimate thing that had you know such devastating force and how people can be convinced to do something that takes great great lengths 
and justify it. Yeah. Right. And that was, I think the, the challenge is to say, you know, it's hard to know what would things look like if they had not dropped the bomb or hadn't built the bomb. And it's really, I think it's really fascinating because in some respects you could look at AI and the way we see it right now, it is, it's just a tool. And there's so many things that correlate to the spiritual side of things when you start thinking about the potential implications of AI. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that that's something that, that we ought to kind of throw out onto the table as for consideration. Sure. You know, what I'm stunned with is how, when we create, we can't help but create within the framework of God's creation. And we find that we're mimicking the things that he did because yeah. we work on the framework, right? I, yeah. I've talked to you before about how in games and in game design, you don't render the inside of trees. You render the outside of trees. Yeah. And what's interesting is in the quantum world, it's what's bizarre is it's like, well, we have this thing called superposition and it doesn't become the state that it is until it's observed. And it's interesting that consciousness and who we are matters in the partnership between the creation and what is rendered, yeah. right? Because their waveform collapses when we are actually observing it. And it's interesting that I think more and more people are examining this idea that what is the relationship between us and consciousness, which is unique from the animals and is, um, and it, it kind of determines the, the, um, the rendering, if you will, of the object, right? This in, in people, I would say non-spiritual people would say it's, it's kind of manifesting your future, right? Creating your own future. But then if you look at AI, it's funny to me that, you know, we have these stories before the flood of the Tower of Babel, and we see this, you know, we see this, um, you know, becoming gods. And then here we are once again, essentially getting to the point where we've got this transhumanist group of people who are really into AI thinking, okay, we can live forever. We can overcome death and, you know, the fear of that and that we're going to become gods ourselves. And really, I think the, the challenge between kind of general intelligence and super intelligence is the sentient, this idea that, well, it's going to become its own thing. Yeah. It's going to, or at least give the illusion of its own thing meaning that it's it's actually aware and what i'm what i'm fascinated by is I, I read the book from the 1930s called think and grow rich by napoleon hill and it's one of the first kind of self-help books of that era and what's interesting is they talk about infinite intelligence that's how he talks about god in that book and he intentionally uses that rather than god and i think partly to be appealing to a wider audience and he talks about this idea that there is there is this interface. There's this one that you can talk to that knows everything and that you could actually talk to this one person and have access, not just to all of infinite intelligence, but the kind of intelligence that's necessary for you to accomplish the mission that you were created for. Yeah. And of course, that's what the last 31 episodes have been about. And it's interesting that what what people that are in the kind of transhumanist world, they're trying to build a digital God. But yeah. what's funny about it is it reflects the very nature of the actual God. Yeah. That they would have an interface, that they would have a friend, that they would be able to chat with, that they would be able to interact with and talk to, who would give them information that is infinite. Yeah. And it's it, the irony of it is so like not lost on me. But to think that, what, what's your take on that? That here we just can't help it. No matter who you are, you can't get away from the fact that you're trying to recreate what already exists. Yeah, what a fun question. I mean, we could take up the rest of the, the episode on that, on that question because it has so many tentacles that, you know, both flow into it and exit out of it. Um, okay, let's just take the concept of, you know, transhumanism, living, you know, for forever, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. 
the Bible talks about this story called the flood. And prior to the flood, men were living a thousand years at, as part of the first segment of, of quantifying the span of life um, living apart from God, making the choice to live apart from him. Now, the way that that was expressed is, you know, both metaphorically as well as practically that by choosing to feast off the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden story, as opposed to choosing to feast off the tree of life. So the first question I would ask is, why are we choosing to feast off the thing called knowledge with the promise of living forever instead of feasting off the tree that tells you by its very name that you can live forever? Yeah, wow. Why would you choose that other tree? That makes no sense. The tree of knowledge. Wow. If, if the objective is to live forever, then hey, it wasn't even a question. That's really cool. I've never thought about it that way. That is awesome. Okay. So now, why would he first think in those terms? And more importantly, why would the serpent see that as an entry point to exploit? Well, because the real objective is not to live forever. The real objective is to be able to control my life forever. Yeah. I get to choose what I'm going to do, when I'm going to do it, how I'm going to do it. And as I do that, I want to do that forever because I choose not to die. All right. Well, okay. Jehovah says, all right, guys, I'll give you a shot at it. I'm going to give you a thousand years in this first go around to see what happens when you, when you live like that. You can live for a thousand years. You can make all of your choices exactly the way that you want it without a single consideration for me. And let's see how it goes. And the way this, the scriptures describe it, the way Moses, the way Jehovah described it to Moses, who then wrote it in the book of Genesis, is that every thought and intention of the heart and mind was solely to do evil. Whoa. And if you actually go into the definitions of the words rather than the translation, the translation portrays Jehovah as being pissed off at the whole thing. And so pissed off, he regretted even making man. That's how the translators render those words. And it's 100% wrong. It is portraying a picture that did not exist and has nothing to do with the nature and character of God. God looked at them and felt sorry, felt compassion. Um, what we would feel when we look at somebody in a deep sense of suffering and so he said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. The outcome of this is that, yeah, you're getting a chance to do everything you want, the way you want it, without any barriers placed on you, and what you don't know is you're being exploited in measures you cannot comprehend and the effect of it. Even though you were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage, even though you were doing these things that satisfy the body in eating and drinking, and satisfy the soul in marrying and giving marriage and in engaging in all of those things that would otherwise be considered a blessing, in not one of those things are you considering God in any of that. 
It's not that they were heinous. It wasn't that they were overtly wicked. It just that it had nothing of the life of God in it. They were not feasting on the tree of life. They were feasting on the tree of knowledge. And God said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to protect my man. I'm going to send a flood. I'm going to stop all of this. And before he ever did that, he said, I'm going to limit the life of my man to 120 years. Now, the way that we would describe that in, you know, in our common vernacular is I'm going to, I'm going to deliver my children from their misery. And we're going to kind of start this thing over again. And you see that in the description of how Jehovah describes Noah, who did all that Jehovah commanded. Now think about that. If you define evil, and this is the way Jesus defined it to me, evil is, is any thought, intention, or action that is apart from God. That's evil. It can look like the greatest thing in the world. So while it looks good, it doesn't have good because it does. It is absent of the of the presence of God's life in it. That's why it's evil. It's not that it's heinous or malicious or wicked. It's just that it doesn't have any life in it. It's born out of knowledge, out of the mind and heart of the individual. And so because the individual is limited, subject to death, all it can do is produce limitation and, and death. Well, God doesn't look at that as good. God, God looks at that as evil and says, hey, man, I got a better way for you. And so he says about Noah, in contrast to every other one where there was not one single thought that was not saturated and conceived in evil, by contrast, he describes Noah as doing all that Jehovah had commanded. Wow, what a contrast. What a contrast. And the one who did all that God commanded was doing stuff he had no experience in, had never observed, had no engineering training, there's no record of him being a carpenter. There's no record of him having any tools of any sophistication to be able to do anything. And yet, what was 120 years and he built an ark that we marvel at today with all of our capabilities because he did all that Jehovah commanded. Well, well, Matt, that, that to me is, okay, now let's weave that all the way back to the AI transhumanists and stuff like that. Well, yeah. okay, have at it, boys. So if you live a thousand years and, and what increases in you is what is already there, which is perverse to its core, in a thousand years, how what's that perversion going to look like in you? I want no part of that. Mm. God, give me my 120 years and let's call it good. Yeah. Wow. Really? There's so oh, much that, in that. So there, that's the big rock. Um, yeah. You know, it's, so that's how I look at the whole transhumanism and using this stuff to live forever. You yeah. know, it's, it's not about living forever. It's, it's about being able to have the absolute liberty to make whatever decisions, do whatever you do without consequence forever. Yeah. Yeah. And all you're going to end up doing is producing misery for you and everybody around you, even though you're eating, drinking and marrying, giving in marriage. Yeah. Yeah. It's an illusion. You know, it's what's amazing. Things. See, this is so good. This is so good. You know what I love about it? So I'm going to, I'm going to bring, so let's go to, let's go to this moment where, where the commandment of God to Noah. Okay. Yeah. So let's just imagine it's us, right? So yeah. everybody who's listening to this, it's us and we're there. So what you're saying, Steve, 
is that at that time when all this craziness was happening, that Noah was listening to Jehovah. Yep. And what's fascinating about this is, you know, you said so many times, it's so simple. Yeah. Like the more and more you look at it, it's like, wow, it's simple. And you can continue to probe this. What I think is so amazing about this journey with you and in, in all of this is that it constantly comes back to the lowest common denominator. And it's like the story after story after story is one who is walking with God, who says, all right, I'm going to take your word for it that you've got something for me to do. Yeah. I'm just going to make that assumption that I'm not here by accident. And so rather than going and feasting off this tree of knowledge, I'm going to feast off this tree of life, which is what is life while I'm here, but you. Yeah. And it sounds like you know exactly why you made me and, and why you put me here and what to accomplish. So, you know, it's interesting that, that Jesus would knock on your door and say, hey, you interested? And I love the way that you present it, right? Hey, are you interested? Well, yeah. You, you know, what we're saying is th there's a hell of a benefit to this thing. If you actually like are interested, it's like, hey, you know, this is the way, right? The way, the truth, the life. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is one of the big challenges of all this. And I, it's, it's so binary in some respects because you're, you're like, hold on. Does this God does this Jesus character, does this guy actually speak? Well, it, whenever I'm looking at scriptures, it seems like that's the story. Yeah. The story is a God who interacts with his people and gives them purpose, direction, commandments, all of these things, so that things would go well for them. Yes. That there is compassion, there is direction. Now, you're going to see it as, you know, consider it pure joy, brothers, when facing troubles of many kinds. You need to understand that these trials are a part of this thing, but that ultimately there's purpose in it. And what's so beautiful about this is, is how cleanly and simply you have nailed the whole AI thing. And it's once again, man going his own way saying, hey, I, I, I want to be in control of my... I don't want to submit to anyone else. I want, you know, I want to, I want all the power and all the knowledge and all the stuff. And it's interesting how much of it, that is a lie because now, now help me understand this. I see that as this fundamental of, Hey, do you want to go your own way or you want to go my way? But then there's also this one to say, AI is a tool. Yeah. Steve, I use it to make sure I can communicate more clearly and it helps me do that. I use a shovel and it helps me dig more. And then, hey, if I want to utilize a backhoe, we can get a lot done. The intent that I have in that, and it even says in the scriptures about what the cost is if you kill your neighbor's bull on purpose or by accident. Yes. Which is yep. really this concept of, of intent. Yes. And it seems like we've got some freedom to move forward with the tools. Yeah. And I don't know which way it's going to go. I think a lot of people think, well, you know, it's going to be like Terminator and they're going to, you know, turn around and enslave us and in, in that. But it sounds like at least where it sits right now, that this tool that promises access to knowledge is in a way this choice that Satan made to Jesus himself. Yeah. It's like, I'll give you all of these things if you just give me your authority. Yeah. And it's interesting that you get to benefit from the tool if you don't, and it, and it comes back to the whole, you can't serve God in money. Yeah. It's like very, very straightforward. Like it's a tool. It's not a God. Yeah. Wow. We did that in 50 minutes, Steve. <laughs> Ready to move on. <laughs> that is so legit. It's so big. And you know what, Steve, I love about it. It's like, we didn't prep anything. I just said, hey, we're going to talk about AI. And you just brought the heat. <laughs> Folks, I hope you see this stuff. Like I see it. I'm just absolutely blown away by it. Because you know what's so neat about it is it resonates as true, Steve. And it makes things so simple. And, I, and it almost sheds its complexity. Yeah. 
like it, all the complexity of the conversations that we often have. And I listen to and all the details of how this works and how it's like a brain and, you know, neural networks and systems and all that. But then you think about it. Well, what, what is it saying to you? It's like, do you want to feast off all this knowledge? Well, you're right. Yeah. If you treat it, if you put money in its proper place, it's a great tool. If yes. you put the internet in the right place, it's a good tool. So let me ask you this. There's obviously with someone like Noah, there's the directive and the outcome that we see, which is a big ass boat. Yeah, <laughs> there's a boat, right? Now, there's not always that kind of clarity for everyone that approaches this Jesus, right? Like, yeah. I don't say like, hey, Jesus, what do you want to do? The boat thing I told you about yesterday and the day before and the day before and the day before. Yeah. That's not what I'm getting, Steve. I'm yeah. not getting boat, 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 boat. How does one traverse this to say all right there's obviously a lot of freedom in this as well yeah um but i love how you outline this idea of nature and character can you weave those things together too because not everyone is called to build a boat yeah so how does the you know what people would consider how's the average joe engage in this when not everyone is chosen to build the boat to save humanity yeah to, to talk to that because I think that that's an issue that a lot of people deal with. It's nice to look and point out the guy who saves, you know, does this big, big thing. But what about the person who doesn't feel like they did the big, big thing? They're still, and they still want to do this the right way. Well, the question I asked is what makes you think that whatever you're doing is not a big thing? Yes. In man's eyes, you're absolutely right. Absolutely. Yeah, would, you, you know, that every one of us, who produce offspring, produce eternal beings. Mm. So whatever that child is going to do, we start open the show about kids coming into the house. Yeah. And yeah. you know why? Well, I'm, I'm totally interested in them. And one of the, uh, one of many of the interesting, interested elements in me is this is an eternal being. This person is going to impact eternity and everything that eternity is comprised of for eternity. Now, if that's not big, I, man, I'm having trouble defining big. That's a good point. It's so helpful to, to say that, though, Steve. The world doesn't say that to, to like a mom who's beat down. You know what I mean? The world isn't saying, "Or well, hey, look, you're you're creating eternal beings." I, that's helpful, in my opinion. Well, it's perspective, right? Yeah. I mean, it's in what I've described. It's the difference between the perspective that comes out of the tree of knowledge of good and evil from the from the perspective that comes out of the tree of life. Yeah. This is a living being that you are interacting with. You are a living being you will produce forever what is it that you're interested in producing hmm. are you interested in producing something that will continue forever or are you interested in only just the momentary impact and effects i'll have okay. i mean it does not take a genius to sit back and say, hmm, is this act, action, or thought going to produce something of value that adds value to the human family? Now, you may not use that those precise words, but the concepts are still there no matter how a person thinks. Mm -hmm. Am I going to do this for the benefit of others? Am I doing this for the benefit of myself alone? You deal with it all the time on your stream. Yeah. You know, considering others in addition to yourself. Well, what is that? That's a connected thought. That is a connected motivation. That's a connected intent with the, with the intent of producing a valuable connected service product or service that benefits humanity. Well, that's not complicated. That's pretty dang simple. 
And so the first part of my, my answer to you is there's not a person listening to this or exists on the planet that is not producing a boat. Hmm. Whether they understand it or not. So good, Steve. Just that is so keep good. taking the steps. Yeah. Well. Wow. Wow. And and so what you're doing is you're looking through the lens of life that says, "Man, this thing isn't stopping at the end of the at the end of this little road here. The end of that road is just the beginning of the next road." Yeah. Which yeah. is the beginning of the next road? Which is the beginning of the next? Okay. That's why Jesus says, by the way, follow me. Yeah. Just follow me, man. Um, just follow me. See what it's like. You'll, well, and you'll, you'll dig it. Trust me. And you know what's so cool? And I'm, I'm going to go on to a rabbit trail here <laughs> because I'm just overwhelmed with how awesome this is. You know, we talked about Peter, James, and John, and they're seeing Jesus talk to Moses and Elijah. And you said one, I don't know if it was like episode 17, you said, what are they talking to him about? They're conferring. Like, you know, imagine you're standing off and here's the transfigured Jesus, right? And like, he's talking to Moses and Elisha. And you're like, and he, I think you said, they're not dead. Yeah. And now think about this for a second. I, you know, and I think about my dad passing and I think about this idea of, you know, you just said, hey, you're, you're, you raised children that are eternal. You know, and you think about this kind of waypoint that this life is, right? It went from a thousand years pre-flood and, and maybe even before that, much longer. And there's a lot more to this story than we see and know. And then it was, by grace, shortened. Yes. And, you know, at times I think about, you know, there is a certain discipline here. And one of the things that I feel like you've been really helpful for me to understand is, you know, this idea of nature, character, and the choices that we make is a form of discipline, right? Yes. Like, I, I'm thinking about these things differently now. And I'm like, what is, you know, like, I have to have, a, you know, there's a lot of no things. Like, for example, if I were to go out on a bender and drink a bunch, I'd feel like crap in the morning, right? Yeah. And I'd be less effective. I also see that if I don't get my, keep my blood sugar together, I'm not as effective. If I don't get enough sleep, I'm not as effective. Right. There's a number of things where. Um, and it, it's interesting to think and to hold these thoughts captive to the the very simple. And that, that's what I love about this framework is that in, even in the depths of its complexity, if you back out from it, and have the right perspective, it's simple. You have this at least these waking moments of choice. And you can either choose to do it apart from or with God. And what does it mean? You know, in some respects, do I always carry around, you know, you know, my buddy Jesus? Well, in some respects, his nature and character, right? He, you know, created in his image. Yes, you do carry him around with you. And it reminds me of you and, you know, leaving baseball and going, yeah, let's, let's go, let's go places together. And, but also to, to recognize and I feel like this is what this whole series of things has helped me with is to just be thinking about in every moment, what is the nature and character, right? Because, you know, the benefit of considering others in addition to yourself, understanding that Moses and Elijah are alive, you know, just all of these things together, you're, you're going, okay, it gives me way, way, way more confidence of moving forward, if you will. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting. And I love, thank you for saying we're all building a boat. Well, I really about, think, yeah, go, go. No, again, think about this. Um, Jesus gets crucified. We, you know, celebrate Christmas. I mean, we celebrate all kinds of, you know, holidays, Christmas for him being born, uh, Easter for his resurrection, you know, mm -hmm. as, the, as the culmination of the crucifixion. And next to him is this guy who is a thief and a murderer. Right. And this thief and, the mur and murderer 
uh, says to him, hey, Jesus, um, why don't you, if you're the son of God, why don't you prove that by climbing down off that cross and taking us with you? And then there was another thief next to him who says, dude, you and I deserve to be here. Leave him alone. He is an innocent man. He does not belong here. Now, nobody paused to stop and say, well, then why is he there? That's left for us to inquire about. Well, if you're innocent, then why in the heck are you there? What really are you doing? And then he says to Jesus, he says, remember me in paradise. Yeah, yeah. Remember me when you come into your throne. Yeah, when you come into your kingdom. Yeah. How amazing. Yeah. Wow. Jesus says, hey, cool. We'll do that this afternoon. <laughs> that sound good to you? Wow. Now, that thief, the culmination of his life was to make that declaration, how much bigger of a boat do you want that guy to build? No. Hmm. He just portrayed to everyone who observed that scene and those who have read about it for centuries, he's describing something that is so simple and profound in the realization he switched from the tree of knowledge to the tree of life while the other did exactly the opposite and both are portraying that have for thousand now two thousand years how much bigger of a boat do you want yeah i think about every time i go to a funeral i think about that that's like the one thing that's always in the front of my mind is today you'll be with me in paradise yeah and you think about that, you know, all the things that we argue about and the church wrestles with, and here's this one who, you know, stands condemned and this, hey, remember me. And of course, there's so much wrapped up in this idea of speaking and looking Jesus and just saying, remember me in your kingdom. Yeah. You know, it, it says so much about how his heart is and what he, what he understands Jesus to be. And it's how cool. That, it, you know, you can bring that, what you're saying, to this binary thing between the knowledge of good and evil and the, and the tree of life. And it's interesting. Yeah. And once again, simple. Simplicity. Well, you know, Jesus said one of the things that Jesus said to, uh, to folks when, you know, that's recorded in the Gospels is that unless you are willing... Uh, he said it like this, you cannot enter into the kingdom unless you enter as a child. Well, one of the difficulties that we have in this, that is a direct confrontation to the promise of knowledge. Yeah. When I'm an yeah. adult, I do not want to think like a child anymore. I've spent an entire lifetime ridding myself of that. Mm-hmm. Now, that may not be the way that you describe it, but the effect of that is that the poison of knowledge says, injects into the whole process, no, I want to understand the kingdom as an adult in the kingdom now. And Jesus says, well, that's not how it works. Okay, I mean, we've given you a model. For how for how this whole thing works now when you've had when you had your little baby and there was laying in the in the in the crib was your baby saying to you man i want to really understand how you changed the plugs in the car that you drove me home from the hospital in dad how did that actually work no what happened again is now back to your you know the nature and character thing the nature and character is not a philosophical concept. It, it, it is a description of the essence of the being that is at work within the individual. So now back to the crib and the child that we talked about it before. Did the parent gain the trust, confidence, and love 
uh, of the baby because the baby understood what it was to be an adult? No. No. They simply experienced and saw the nature and character of love being projected to them from mommy and daddy. They felt it. They experienced it. And it was something different than what they were experiencing by themselves. They didn't experience that in the hospital from the nurse. They didn't experience that, you know, in some religions in the baptism. They experienced it in the crib or in the holding of mom and dad. They didn't understand a word that was spoken or how any of this was done. They just felt something that was bigger and greater than them that swallowed them up into this feeling of some sort that they could not describe. Now, did mom and dad define what nature and character was? No, it was the essence of who they are. Hmm. The essence of who, who they are in their being. Well, guess what? We know certain parents that don't do that. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. We know certain parents that do exactly the opposite. And what do we call both the parents and their children as a result? Do we call them blessed? Hmm. Okay. No, we weep over them. We would have a, ten a tendency to condemn the parents that are, that we would actually call them abusive. Yeah. And then we look at the children who are the products of that abuse and guess what they reflect? The nature and character of their abusers. And they are troubled the entire time of their life until guess what? They make a change. At some point, they will have the opportunity to change, to make a different decision. And then Jesus begins to build in them. If they choose him, they begin to, he begins to build in them his nature and character. See? It's a building process. You know? Del delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Yeah. I totally misunderstood that for so long, thinking it's what I would want, but it's really yeah. actually a redefinition of what he wants through me. Yes. And it's, it's so powerful. You know, I, I think what's so neat, we talked about kind of infinite resolution and and the fact that the framework, you know, almost represents itself. And here you are talking about the baby again, right? I mean, the science folks would say, yeah, if the child doesn't have this, the eyes of the mother or father doesn't have this, the brain does not develop correctly. Yeah. You know, and you, you think about what is connecting through all of those things. And then to think of, the metaphor, you know, because what I've been kind of thinking about recently is this idea of how great in and how expansive God is, right? I just look at his creation of the, the heavens declare, and I'm like, wow. But to think that in all of this, that there would be such lengths gone to to utilize these these metaphors, right, of a father and a son. Yeah. To use these, you know, this metaphor of nature, not metaphor, but the, the nature and character that is expressed across creation. And I think yeah. what's so cool about, you know, what we're doing here with the crypto stuff and everything is to look at it and say, you know, we know that something is wrong because when I do look out, you know, and I'm in the middle of a stream with a fly rod, I'm seeing the nature and character in his creation, right? It yeah. declares itself. Yeah. And then, you know, and then seeing those moments and what do we long for? I mean, I long to daisy chain as many of those good nature and character things together as I can, right? Yeah. I want to sit with you by a fire and with David Lee and Sam Kemp and identity block, right? And I want to <laughs> sit there and I want to, I want to, I want to bask in the goodness of his nature and character that is expressed through you, mm -hmm. right? And, or through David Lee coming to my dad's funeral. Yeah. And I think about these things, you know, what decisions are we making and how does that contribute? And, you know, you said to me episodes back, you said, when Jesus was here, was the kingdom near? 
And I just love it. Right. Yeah. And you think about that, you know, and I know this is a bit of a rabbit trail, but it's this, it's part and parcel of the same thing. We create and are all of us, you know, Da Vinci? No. You know, we create, are we all Mozart? No. But what's interesting is it's all in its perfect form, a version of the truth. It is a, it's a picture of a truth, you know, and I think about uh, Ray and his daughter, who's a, a ballerina, right? So she's, you know, in boarding school, focused completely on being the best ballet dancer she can be. Oh, cool. And there's this moment, and we've all seen it. We've seen it in art. We've seen it in music. We've seen it in dance. We've seen it where someone with preparation meets this opportunity moment, and it takes our breath away. And yeah. we see in that moment truth. We see yeah. in it authenticity. We see in it perfection. And we get a picture or a snapshot of God himself. Like, I feel like that's essentially this. And, you know, here we are in such, you know, times of turmoil and crisis. And when I think about what's the purpose of us building our own boats is this idea that my kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Like this idea that we play a role. And it. what's interesting is like, this this holiday season, right? This Christmas, I could contribute to and express the nature and character of God in my home. Or I could choose something else. Yes. Yes. And it seems like, you know, that's where it's almost like the, the story about how the guy was forgiven his debt and then he went and beat the guy that owed him money is that that seems to be the amazing grace that people sing about this idea that I no longer desire to beat the one who owns owes me yeah. because I recognize how much I have been forgiven yeah. that this is like, it, it's like it all is shed. And you know, that's, I, I guess that's the piece that transcends all understanding, right? That That's kind of where it, it, it meets. What a beautiful thing. Steve. And it's like, what is he, what is the benefit? I mean, it's rest, right? It's like, it's wholeness, it's oneness. And I, and I often think about what is heaven like, Steve? Yeah. And it's like this idea, well, it's not that I'm not going to get sick and, you know, but there are some leaves I could probably eat that are going to help me out. But this idea of being this wholeness or oneness, and we see that picture so many times of, you know, bride and groom and male and female and, and oneness of wholeness and completeness. And it's interesting that for this 120 years that we have now, that he would allow us to walk through this assemblage of knowledge. And it's, it, it does feel like training. It feels like training for what are you going to choose? What are you going to choose? And now I look at the transhumanists. I look at the, the World Economic Forum. I look at those that are being the ones that want to extract, right? The ones that are wanting to enslave. And it's like, well, no wonder the playbook is to separate the family, to get you to be confused about the things that are obvious, like your gender. These, you know, essentially removing the things that are the nature and character of God that are within us. And basically making you confused about who you are. Yeah. And, and it's like, and when you start seeing it that way, you see it almost coming at you from every angle, is that ultimately this goal is to subject you and enslave you. And it seems like right now we're coming into a time where everything is changing and being exposed and like an opportunity for... God's people to say, hey, let's choose his way versus my way. And would what would be the net effect of that? That's just mind-blowing, Steve. Well, it's so very simple, isn't it? Because the, you know, again, if if you're paying attention to anything that's going on on the planet, and in today's world, we can see the entire operation of the planet through this little mechanism that you and I are talking through right now. 
It's so true. Okay. Now, you wind back the clock a couple hundred years ago, you couldn't do that. No. 200 years, well, shoot, 100 years ago, yep. you could not do that. Um, whatever was happening around the world, there had to be a, you know, a pretty concerted effort to bring that information, you know, to the world. Today, it's spontaneous. And so, you know, okay, folks, AI. So you're going to use AI, and now you get to be the guy who decides how AI is going to be used. And one of the one of the options is to use it to where we could build other machines where the animating element within a human can be transported into that machine that can then has a life cycle of its own and it be, can continue to be recycled however whatever that life cycle looks like so it's a 50 year life cycle in 50 years you get yourself another machine you know you get to have another tesla you go wow that's really pretty cool man because when I see the original Teslas compared to today, wow, they're a lot more sophisticated today, even though they the, the originals were pretty dang, dang on yep. sophisticated. Man, I wonder where this is going to end up. You go, that's pretty cool. Well, folks, we don't have our Teslas today, but we do have animating forces that are animating the current devices on the planet, ranging from a ballpoint pen to the powers and levers of government. And every institution of influence and power in between. Well, folks, what do you think about that? Are you happy with not only continuing this, but amplifying it? Well, see, I, I mean, gosh, I look at that and I say, not on your flipping life. Thank you, Lord. I only have 80 or 90 years. Yeah. Or whatever it is. Yeah. See? Now, guess, guess what? My life is not limited to 80 or 90 years. My life is eternal. What is limited to 80 or 90 years is my time on this planet. Or do I want to say, hey, you know, no, nope, that's not what I'm going to do. That's not what we're going to do. we got to change some things. Now, what is it that we're going to change? Are we going to change devices? Man, we got all the devices we can handle. We cannot manage all the devices and capabilities those devices produce. What are we going to do? Well, I, for one, am saying, hey, let's do something different. Okay. Now, I don't know what to do different on a macro level, but I do know what to do different on a micro level True. in me. Yeah. So, if, so if I change me, then maybe what I do can, can then affect others. And if others decide to make a similar choice, then okay, then they change in everything in their in area of influence and it spreads and it spreads and it spreads. Oh, that kind of sounds like the parable of the, of the leaven in the lump of three lumps of dough. That's how the tree of life functions. How is your life going? Are you happy with what, the way things are, ha are coming together? Is there something different that you would like to have happen in your life? You choose. Yeah. That's, not how we're, that's not how we're trained. We're trained to look outside and, and criticize all the wrong that's happening out there and what needs to be done to fix everything out there without fixing me first. Man, I ran into that all the time, like consulting business. Change what my business is doing, but don't change me. Yeah. Uh, dude, you're the guy that's making that happen. Right. You know, I can tweak some devices. I can tweak some processes. I can do some procedural things, but it's all going to end up in the same thing because you're the one that's controlling it all. You are the expression. Your business is an expression of you. If you want your business to change, you have to change. Yeah, I think about the person who's been married four times. 
It's always someone else's fault, huh? See, right? Yeah. I mean, it goes everywhere. Okay, it what's uh, crypto so, saying? Yeah, so AI in superintelligence mode could be considered the false prophet. Believe people will believe everything it says and will use it like an oracle. This is interesting, and I, I wanted I saw this comment, and I want to I want to talk about it. You know, in the context of the tools, right? Is you know what we're really talking about, which I think you just just mentioned, is what is your purview? What responsibility do you have? Well, first and foremost, it's you, right? That's the point yeah. you just made. Yeah. And you think about this. If this device exists, right? Well, are there people right now who get caught up in things that aren't super intelligent that actually basically command and direct their lives? Absolutely. There's all kinds of things that we get ourselves into, whether it's addiction, whether it's relationships, there's all kinds of things that we end up submitting ourselves to and we become subject to. And so this idea that there would be one who would be a false prophet or would be like an oracle, you know, I don't know. Is it going to be, you know, is it going to present itself as a entity, right? So some people would say, and I heard this last night when I was watching the the whole thing between Tucker Carlson and um, what's his name, Alex Jones, is that there are some people who believe that this is just going to become you know, this antichrist, right? That this will be this entity that is perceived as sentient and is, you know, I think there's a lot of fear around this that would be like God, like this would be the the false prophet, if you will. And what I feel like I'm learning from you today is to say, in Jesus, you have control of your own actions, of your own self, of your own choice. Now, there are some people who are extreme preppers who will be like, well, get out to the rural areas, dig yourself a home and start yourself a fire and cook your meal and be away from all of this stuff. OK, fine. But whether you're doing that, you're still making your own personal decisions. And the question is, are you engaging with this? You know, do I see this tool like Steve or like um, David Lee said that people are using this tool right now? to auto select targets in drone warfare. Yeah. Yeah, they're animating this tool to pick out moving objects to be able to fire upon. Will they get to the point where it fires on its own and kills people? Well, yeah, probably. The question is, is it going to have some sort of spiritual power over you? And I would say the one who is in you is greater than the one who's in the world and that you will continue to have the choice. How do you see it? You know, I think there's a lot of people who are drumming up a lot of fear around the Antichrist and the, you know, taking over of AI as being this boogeyman. But what I hear from you is to say, well, these are tools and you have choice. Yeah. Enslavement is is possible, but how do you see it? Well, being enslaved is, on, is only a threat if you know you're enslaved. If you think that you're free while you're a slave, guess what? That's the best possible state for you to be in, insofar as your enslaver is concerned. Now that's the Matrix movie right there. Okay. Well, there you go. It, 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 these things are basic and fundamental. So let's let's kind of take a little bit of a crack at, uh, at this. Um, okay, how does AI come... And I ask quite rhetorical questions. I'm going to answer them, you know, for sake, you know, for brevity's sake here. Um, how did AI come about? Did it create itself? Nope. A human created. Okay. When a human created it, how did the human come up come up with the idea to create it? And how did the human then possess the ability to create it once it came in contact with the idea? Okay, now we're going to put that up. We're going to leave that open ended for a minute, put that off to the side. So we have this device called AI. Can that, and now we've created this incredible capability of this device. Um, and now this device has, to, has the potential, as CryptoPez says, to be the false prophet. 
I would say, well, does a device have the capacity to be the, a false prophet? Can a device do that? Can the device just all by itself decide to become something? Well, what I would offer is, uh, man, unless somebody turns, turns that puppy on, it's just going to sit there and do nothing. It has the most incredible, expansive capability that that capability cannot be activated until somebody turns on the device. That shovel, that backhoe, it sits there doing nothing until somebody turns it on one way or the other. Okay. So you'd say in this particular instance, well, a, a human being needs to turn that on. Okay. Let's say the human being has needs to turn that on. And then the human being can, once it's turned on, can AI just decide to do what it's going to do all by itself? Well, I say no, not really. It has to be directed. It is a device. All right. Well, who's going to direct that? Well, again, the human being. All right. Fine. So now we have a device, all kinds of capability. It needs to be turned on. Now we go, who, what's going to turn it on is a, is a human being. A human being is now going to turn that on and activate it. Well, now we have the device of the human being called the body. Well, the body is simply a device. Can a body do anything it wants by itself? Well, the way we think about it is yes, because we see ourselves as a, as a single unit. I'd say, well, I just came from a, you know, from a funeral Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Uh, that device didn't look like it was doing much. I think that device pretty much was done. It was like the, like the gun on the table. Had all the, the earmarkings of a living human being absent one thing, the animating element. So then I'd say, okay, now the device, the human being, the body, the body is a device. It's neutral. It's not going to do anything. It then requires somebody to turn it on. What turns it on? I'd say the animating force, the life, the spirit of the person. Okay. Then the next question I'd ask is, well, what about who directs the person? Who influences the person? The person is now going to animate the body, which is then going to use to animate and turn on the device of AI then the question I'd ask is, okay, at this stage is, then who is actually the false prophet? Yeah. See, I'd go, I would go from the, the influencing element of the animating force of the human through the human body to the machine called AI, through the machine outward. I'd say the false, the machine is being, the device is being used by an animating force, which is the false prophet, which is a, in my vocabulary, would be a spiritual element, a spiritual influence that's affecting the human operator. And then you'd say, well, okay. I'm not talking about that kind of an AI. I'm talking about a self-existing, self-operating, self-directing machine that has the capacity to operate independent of any other influence or force. And I'd say, well, you're talking about a capability that uh, we do not possess and will not possess for a long time. So if you're afraid that that's going to be, or concerned that that's going to be the cause, then what are you doing today to give permission to that or, re or deny permission for that to happen? Because again, it's not going to happen without your permission. Now, once you start there, now you're going back to, okay, well, maybe, maybe I do have a little more capability than what I think I do. 
I'm not concerned with the device being false profit. The device doesn't have that capability. And we do not have the capacity to produce life, which is a self-animating element. And if we ever do get to that place, well, then that's a, then that's a world we know nothing about other than conceptually right now. And so what are we going to do to deal with that? It all happens by permission is the point. So the device cannot be the false prophet without us giving us giving it the permission to be that. Yeah. You know, an interesting perspective. So when I was a kid, my dad had all kinds of different dogs. I mean, we had, we would like lived at a zoo basically, but we had a pit bull when I was a kid and it was the sweetest dog and the smartest dog and most loving dog we ever had. Right. Well, everybody that ever knew that we had a pit bull thought that, that we had this ferocious thing that was going to devour the children. Right. And they were not very smart dogs. They were protective, but wonderful dogs. Yeah. But then also I have met folks who have them who have trained them and they will literally tear you apart. And I think about training, right? Right now we talk about AI in the context of training. You have to give it information. You yeah. have to train it right now. What everyone's fearful of, and this might actually be one of the techniques of the the forces of darkness themselves is the fear that goes into thinking that sentience is is possible because the perception of sentience of of consciousness and actual consciousness may actually be an illusion meaning that you know you think about when legion you know jesus is like they recognize him and say send us into the pigs they need a host yes and i and i could easily see that the illusion of this system that is animated from behind the scenes is giving the uh, the it's presenting itself as sentient right so one of the guys at google was like he was confident that this chatbot had become a real person it wanted rights it wanted all these things and you're like well you could make a really interesting case that it was trained now does it do its own you know feedback loop of thinking and those things and what is consciousness right but you make a really good point is that what is the point in which it becomes a host for yeah. And in a way, the dog is a host for its training, and AI is a host for its training. And if you think as are we, as are we, that exactly the point. Yeah. And that we could literally say, "All right, I'm going to give myself over to this because it promises something of benefit." Sammy Davis Jr. was famously um, quoted as saying, "Did you know that Satan is as strong as God?" Direct quote from Sammy Davis Jr. Hmm. Which would indicate to you that maybe Sammy Davis Jr. traded something for something else. And it's interesting to think, you know, it comes back all the way around that, you know, I was watching the the Google, it's called Gemini. Yeah. And Google's new Gemini is better than chat GPT-4. And they did this big keynote speech. And one of the things is they had these academics say, you know, one of the things that we do is we read these um, academic articles. And how it works right now is... There's thousands and thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of these papers that could be relevant to what we need it to be. And so people go through those and read them and pull out necessary data and put those into databases. And it said that when they utilized the data set, which was millions of uh, these um, papers, over a period of 60 minutes, it was able to review, distill, and give um appropriate database basically fill the database in 60 minutes of 200,000 articles hmm. well guess what it did what it was told to do yes and that's a wonderful benefit right the tool it's like well i've been digging for a while and you came along with a you know a steam shovel right you came with a backhoe and you're like wow i didn't know that you know we could do this so much more efficiently the big fear, though, is I think maybe perhaps the lie is that we're being prepared for the illusion, just like when Dorothy goes into the Great Oz. He's like, oh, no, and it's really the man behind the curtain. And I hope that that's the case because, you know, and this is going to get weird really fast, but I don't know if you know this, but there's some really cool video, UFO video from Fukushima. Remember when Fukushima, the, the nuclear plant, exploded? Hmm. Yes. 
15 lights appeared in the sky when that explosion happened and they moved. There's all kinds of video of this. And what was interesting is there, there was some concern about, you know, this radioactivity and what's the measurement of the radioactivity dropped like by half or more in like a moment. Hmm. And there's been a number of things that they're, you know, seeing that nuclear stuff has been bringing these entities, if you will, the watchers or whoever you want to call them. Um, they're very, very concerned about our nuclear capabilities. And it's interesting to think, you know, here we are coming up on Christmas. And I imagine those stinky shepherds out in the field. And literally, they it says a multitude of angels appeared. <laughs> and I was thinking about Fukushima, like a multitude of angels appeared and sang. Yeah. And then they were gone. And then they were gone. And, and I think about this, you know, you talk about, you know, two sides of the coin and, you know, we don't see everything. And to think that none of this is a mystery to the one who created it all. Yeah. Right on. Um, it's crazy. One of the things that I that I have found so um, fascinating, delightful, uh, I mean, human vocabulary really falls short of being able uh, to describe it, just reassuring is again, using our metaphor of tree of life, tree of knowledge. The thing about knowledge is that it promises us short-term results at the expense of long-term destruction. Whereas life says, okay, let's do these things that produce, promote, and support life in their proper timing. Man, we have a thousand examples we could give to that. Um, going back to the gun on the table, you would put the gun in the hand of a three-year-old. Why? Because the three-year-old in its life progression has not gotten to the place where it can properly handle the device of the gun. So what do you do? You train the child to be able to handle it responsibly so that it contributes to life, doesn't distract from life or diminish life. We get the idea. Well, the question I ask is, what is it that is stimulating my concern over what devices do? Am I being inspired about what the device will do for the benefit of humankind, or am I being instilled with fear about what the device will do against hum humankind? Now, we're just looking at something that gets inspired for good, expired for, with, by fear. Well, we don't take the next step. Why am I being inspired for good? Why am I being captured by fear? Where is that fear coming from? What is its purpose and design? And is that something I should be concerned about? Is that something worth examining? And here's what you find out, at least I have, on this tree of life metaphor, is that there are two kinds of fears. There is the fear that works for your benefit, and there is the fear that works to your detriment. One preserves your liberty and your life and well-being. One captures that. Amen to that. For the purpose for enslaving. So what is the nature of this fear that is causing me? And I'm going to I'm kind of kind of use uh, piggyback on crypto as his comment about the false prophet. Why would I be afraid of AI becoming the false prophet? 
And more importantly, why am I even afraid of that? What is it that's being stimulated in me to create fear about that device? Mm -hmm. That device can't do anything. Oh, let me see if I get this right. The day's going to come and I'm going to have a lawnmower that's in my garage. It's going to mow my lawn based on its own assessment of the condition of my yard. It's going to turn itself on. It's going to open my garage. It's going to go out there and it's going to cut the grass. It's going to do all of that without a single bit of input from me. Well, what happens if it decides to cut the grass every three days to keep it nice and trim? Because that's the decision it makes. But hey, I like my grass to have a little leaf on it. So I don't want it to be cut any more than seven days. Is my lawnmower all of a sudden going to be taking control over me and saying, no, 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 Stags, it doesn't matter what you want. I'm a self-determining device that is determined on my own what is best for your yard. Well, is that yep. really what you're doing? Are you just making that decision for my yard or are you making that decision on your own? Yeah. See, what, what really is going on there? See, what I would submit is that the human goes over there. Well, you may take that position, but check this out, Charlie. Quick. Yeah. Well, that's a you from the power source. And what's amazing, too, is in that analogy, you're absolutely right. It's you have authority over your lawnmower and you can't imagine your lawnmower mowing for you. You know what's amazing about that? That analogy extends to the authoritarian state. Yeah. I can create systems and processes in which you don't have authority. I yeah. can tell you what light bulbs to have, how much water to have in your toilet. I can dictate things against your will. And you realize, I think when you start thinking about it in those terms, yeah, the devices that I have authority over, I turn off. Yeah. But those that are out there, the powers that are be, and that's why I think what a great example is to say that the illusion of the false prophet is definitely there yeah. because there are those who are going to use this powerful mechanism not in the nature of the of of God's nature and character, but in their own selfish ambition and enslave you with it. Here's and, the illusion, Matt. Yeah. Here's the illusion. We think the false prophet can do what he wants right. on his own, independent exactly. of us. It can't. It is one hundred percent dependent on our permission. remove its permission, and it ceases to be able to function. So let me ask you this. Is this literal or metaphoric? So, for example, David Lee says the U.S. government's now using AI to identify targets. Okay. Yeah. So let's say you and I are in the field, right? Mm -hmm. We're the resistance, and you and I are in the field, and we're moving. And the U.S. government has decided with its AI that you and I are targets. Okay. Yeah. I can stand there and look at that drone all day long and say, you do not have authority over me, and it would shoot me in the head. Yep. But yep. someone has animated that, not me. Yep. I've lost authority. It has authority over me because it's going to kill me. And let's say it does. I agree with you fundamentally that in the context of Jesus, I do actually have authority over it, long, yep. like ultimately because of, of eternity. But in the natural, this is what I think is going on fundamentally, is that there is someone behind the scenes who is the false prophet, who is animating the tool, and it is enslaving you. Yes. Is that true? Am I defining them correctly? Uh, I would add a couple of elements to that to, to fill in the blanks of, you know, of uh, the offer of my answer to you. It goes back to our to our conversation a few episodes back on the difference between authority and power. All right. In, in the scenario that you are describing, the, the ones who are, and let me first talk about the difference. In the domain of evil, evil does not have authority to function. I'm even going to put this at the spiritual level for in this progression of thought. 
Powers of darkness do not possess authority to rule. So powers of darkness do not possess the ability to independently manipulate and maneuver and control or enslave one human being, not one. So how do they do that? Through the use of power. It uses the authority granted by the permission of human beings given to it to then convert that authority to power and then using, using that, uh, that power as a mechanism to overcome and neutralize authority. Yep, yep, gotcha. Okay, so it's the issue between power and authority. So now let's go back to how did that animating force get to the place where it had captured the authority to, um, to then activate power in order to kill you and I on the ground? Well, I would say, first of all, the false prophet gained its authority to function in the earth through the millions of people in, in America that grant that it secured their authority, their permission to function. Yep. And then there were, there were individuals who were put in positions to operate the devices and then it and then it influenced their animating force and the vocabulary that we're talking about to animate the device to then come after you and I and kill us. So the issue is not our lack of authority. The issue is our lack of power. All right. So now, how do we neutralize that power? Well, when the millions of people grant authority, their authority to utilize power against me, uh, guess what? Their authority is being used for evil purposes to then come against me and you. And so the issue is not authority. The issue is power. Yeah. Now, Jesus went through that very same thing, you know, um, when he was when he was on the planet. You know, you, you shared many times and, you know, in, in our streams and in, you know, the crypto screen, uh, streams about, you know, Peter being confronted in his group to be conf being confronted with paying the, the poll tax. And then them saying, does your, does your teacher, interesting they didn't use master, uh, but teacher, does your teacher not pay the poll tax? Speaking of Jesus, and Peter says, yep, he does. Well, okay, he's committed both him, you know, committed him and Jesus to do that. And Peter comes in, you know the story. And before Peter can say a word, Jesus asks him, Pete, the kings of the earth, do they collect taxes? from their own children or from those who are outside, from strangers. And Peter says they collect them from strangers. And Jesus makes this profound answer that we just don't spend any time thinking about. He says, correct. Therefore, the sons are exempt from obligation and are free. Now, pause and think about that for just a second. Therefore, the sons, the children of the kings, are exempt from obligation and therefore are free. Well, where does that put the taxpayer then? The taxpayer is not exempt from obligation. He's put under obligation. The taxpayer is not free. The ta taxpayer is what? Enslaved. Mm. Whoa, wait a minute here. I thought it was my duty to pay taxes. 
Well, it is if you give permission for your for them to tax you. But when you do, remember what you have done at that point. See, you have put yourself under obligation and you have converted yourself from one who is free to one who is enslaved. Well, I'll be daggone if that's not exactly what happened in the garden. Yeah, yeah. How did that happen? Well, exactly the same way that those people maneuvering those levers of power on the devices of power have gained authority. They have secured it from those millions of people and those millions of people don't even know how it happened. Remove, inform the millions of people, remove that authority and watch what happens to the false prophet. He cannot gain entrance into the planet. He has to have human beings give him permission to enter the planet. Oh, yeah, but wait a minute. Hey, I, let me tell you what. If the forces of darkness had all the horsepower that we think they have and that we continue to assert they do have, they would have dealt with this thing a long, long time ago. This planet was infinitely easier to secure absolute control over in years and generations past than it is today. They have their hands full trying to secure control and power over the human family. And it's getting more complicated, not easier. Why? Well, what I would submit to you is there was this one nation called America Guardian of the estate is the, you know, is the, uh, what America means, guardian of the state that has been introduced to this thing called liberty. The concept that the individual is sovereign, a reassertion, a reintroduction of the original state of God's man in, in the garden, in the creation, that he and he alone was the authority over the earth with God. And that one nation has wreaked havoc, you know, in the, you know, in the domains of darkness. And they are doing everything they can to dismantle that and, re and regain permission granted by the American people to, to get back underneath the authority of darkness as slaves who are under obligation. Now, and I would just simply say, well, folks, we happy with that? Yeah. You know, if, if we are, then let's just continue. If we're not, then maybe let's think about taking a different approach to this thing. Yeah. Well. You know, and it starts with even understanding the concept. The false prophet, the antichrist, all these things that we're talking about, that, that instill fear inside those religiously trained about those threats. They are not a threat unless we give them the permission to be a threat. It's no more complicated than that. Wow. And that's, that's not philosophical, that's practical. Yeah. It's, it's amazing to me when you look throughout history of how technology has enabled change yeah. you know the very nature of how what the printing press was used for you know there are many who would say that what settled the west was the cult 45 yeah and what's interesting is you look into that story is that you know the native americans had the ability to shoot arrows very quickly and if you had to you know pound in another you know uh you know bullet for example um but that rotary thing enabled you to shoot quickly. It's interesting how technology, you know, enables these things. And that's where I, I keep coming back to and kind of want to wrap up with here is um, animating the tools that we have yes. in the nature and character. And, and why I love this whole crypto thing, why I love what we're doing here is what are we trying to contribute to? We're trying to contribute to, in a way, I feel like people need to be encouraged that um, that they are 
building a boat, right? Like this, that's this very core. You matter. Yeah. You, you're here for a reason and you make a contribution to this. And if you understand how this framework works, and that's really what I've taken away from you, Steve, is just, Hey, if you understand who you are, and that's one of the first things you ever said to me is we've forgotten who we are. Yeah. And if you think about who we are in this as a son with authority, being careful of who we give that authority to, but also recognizing that you're right. Years ago, it'd be much easier to take over this whole thing. What yeah. we're seeing is actually a dismantling of it. But as those that are losing their power, you know, I look at this um, world, Eco- no, not the World Health Organization and their desire to get this, um, this new pandemic law, which is a global law that would basically restrict your travel, for example. That's just one example of it. And the people that are rising up and saying no, like the new leader of the Netherlands and the new leader of Argentina. And, you know, because things are being exposed for what they are and that people have been holding back, one of the big things that the whole UFO world is saying is we've had the ability of unlimited, you know, hyperdimensional energy that is abundant and clean for at least 90 years. Hmm. And it has been subdued and kept private because of one, you know, this this whole Manhattan Project, you know, security model, but also because of the lack of control, right? This this idea of controlling the energy is about enslaving the people. And, you know, I look at this next phase, we're gonna see so much change. I was sitting at dinner and no one was listening to me. Mm-hmm. It was like, Ed's talking about AI again. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought about it. I was like, you know what? You you don't know. I see what's coming. And the amazing thing is I feel a sense of obligation and opportunity to animate the tools in the nature and character of God. And that we have a role to play and that we do actually have um, a role to play. And I want to encourage you you know, that all of these things, whether it's the transhumanists, whether it's the AI folks is, or, or, you know, authoritarianism, casting fear, separating people. Um, folks, this is, um, this is tremendous stuff. And Steve, once again, you've blown my mind. Um, and it's what a wonderful perspective to get rerooted. And that's what I'm so thankful about this streams is I feel like every time we spend this time, something special right comes out of it and you're like okay okay this is a really really important reminder for me to understand the difference between authority and power and to understand the nature of animating tools and that we do actually you know it begins with us and that you know i think about what is that as it relates to crypto and what does it mean well it's all relative to every mechanism and every tool it starts with you and you know maybe we do find ourselves targeted by ai and shot in the head but you know what the 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 hope that we have is one of eternity and that's that's helpful so thank you for that reminder you bet you bet you know there's this interesting story um jesus goes in you know goes to this place where where people are gathered, you know, sick people are gathered around this pool. And uh, when you look at it, you know, it's it's the story of the pool that when uh, the waters moved, uh, the legend had it that uh, a, an angel an angel was passing by, and so the first one in the pool um, got a chance to, you know, first one in the pool was the one who was healed, okay? So this, the particular story is about this man who was, you know, crippled from for 38 years, and Jesus comes up to him and asks him this really strange question. Do you want to be healed? Now think about that for just a second. Jesus, you do not give the impression of asking irrelevant questions. Right. So why did you ask this guy who was there for 38 years 
if he wanted to be healed. And the guy says, uh, hey, uh, you know, are you going to put me in the pool? What did he revert to? His existing model. Yep. Well, no. I just want to know if you want to be healed. Well, I don't have anybody to put me in the water. Are you going to put me in the water? No, I just want to know if you want to be healed. Well, Jesus, what did you expect that guy to say? No, nope, I'm not interested. I don't want to be healed. See, what I would offer is Jesus is asking you the most fundamental, asking this gentleman the most fundamental question to see if he really does want to be healed and if he's willing to say yes and transition from his old model to the, to the new model because he's crippled. He's crippled. He's abused. He's taken advantage of. You listen to the story. People are climbing all over him. putting. They are abusing the system that he lives in, has crippled him and abused him and refuses to heal him. They're not interested in him. They're only interested in themselves. So, Jesus, what did you expect him to say? I expected him to see himself in his circumstance to see if he was really interested in changing his circumstance. Well, folks, are we really interested in changing our circumstance? Are we just going to be satisfied because that's what we've done our entire lives is being crippled, incapable of doing things, thinking we're nothing, thinking we're not contributing to anything, thinking we don't have any power, thinking we have no authority, just being crippled and waiting for somebody to put us in the water. Someone who will put us in another illusionary solution. And finally, after the guy thinks all of that, and Jesus kept him zeroed in on, by the way, that's what we do so much in this. We keep pointing it right to it. And finally said, yes, I did. Now, for those who know the story, you know what happened. Jesus said, well, then stand up, take your bed and head on home. And he did. You know, it's always been fascinating to me about that story, Matt. Hmm. Jesus went to one. The place was filled with people who had been in that exact same place, and he went to one. Now, you could look at that and say, well, you know, that's because all the Father told him to go to. True. You could say, well, he's the only one that would respond. Eh, maybe. See, what Jesus says to me is, hey, man, all I need is one. Yeah. All I need is just one person to say, yes, I want to be healed. I don't want to be rid of this place that enslaves me, cripples me, and makes me think that I'm not worth anything. The only thing I'm worth is putting a heel in my neck. Well, let me tell you what, we are moving increasingly into that being mo more overtly seen than any time in my lifetime. Yep. It's not even hidden anymore. And so the question is, hey, man, we want to keep doing that and hope for another illusionary solution like a device is going to help me, call it a pool in that instance, or maybe AI in this instance. Shoot, even crypto. No, no, that's not how it works. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be rid of this thing that enslaves you? Well, there's only one guy I know who can do that. And so we talk about it 
you know, in this stream, and I talk about it everywhere else, not because I'm some religious nut, nor are you. It's because, hey, man, he's the real deal. He's the man. Yeah. Yeah. So, hey, let's, let's, let's hook our wagon to his and see what that looks like. Yeah. And just be willing to say, yep, Jesus, I want to be healed of whatever it is that's just crippling me. And let's do what you're doing. And let's try that for a while. See, to me, that's just so basic, practical, fundamental, yeah. you know. And that's what we talk about. Thank you, Steve, once <laughs> again for episode 31. <laughs> I appreciate it so much immensely what you what you have done and what you're doing. Um I hope this has been a blessing to all of you who've been watching. It certainly has been to me. And we will catch you. I, I assume we have one more before Christmas here, but we'll we'll see. I'll let you know. Um, Steve, have a great weekend. Thank you. You guys too. And thanks again, Matt. All right. We'll catch you in a minute. Wow. You know, when you when you thought, yeah, a barn burner. That's right, Tank. A barn burner. It's so perfect. What an amazing finish to that, too. What, what a cap uh, story to cap that all off. I was watching a video um, about this like renowned neuroscientist, and they were asking him about his faith, and he basically said, yeah, I, basically, I believe in Jesus. And they're like, what, science guy believing in Jesus? And you know what he said? Just what Steve said. He's like, you know what? I just I started reading this stuff, and I started praying, and it became real to me. It had benefits to it. And one of the things I, I took away from that story is this idea of your interest. You know, the, Jesus would ask you that question. Do you want to be healed? The other day, there was a guy who was sleeping out under a tree in our, right on the highway where we live. And he was out of place. He, and he had, a, he had a sign that said he was stranded. And of course, every time I see somebody like that, I ask Jesus, I'm like, you want me to go over to him or not? And sometimes he says no. And sometimes he says yes. And I went over to the guy. I'm like, hey, how you doing, man? And we got to talking and he's like, Hey, can you give me a ride up the road? And I said, yeah, that's, that's fine. I can't take you far. My wife doesn't even know I'm out. And we put his, uh, he, he had like a cart and we put that in the back of the truck. And I, you know, visited with him as we drove down the road a couple miles and come to find out the guy lived in Michigan where I'm from bizarrely. And you know what? He said, yeah, I've been doing this for, what do you say? 30 some odd years, 37 years, something like that. And here was a guy that I realized he's like, no, he's not interested in changing these circumstances. It's actually working out really well for him, right? Are you interested in being healed? No, no, kind of like the way that this works. People are generous to me and I don't have any obligations. And, you know, I can go from place to place and I meet some interesting folks. And, you know, it made me think, all right, do you want to be healed? And it reminds me of people that, you know, we hear about this all the time. Somebody that comes to understand who Jesus is in, in prison or my story where I was literally at the absolute end of myself. And it feels like these moments of, of crises or this point in which he meets you where you are and you're like, I've tried everything I can. I've tried every tree of knowledge and good and evil I can. And what do I got? Nothing. I thought this was going to do it. I thought all this money from crypto was going to do it. I thought that this relationship was going to do it. I thought that this money or this was going to do it when Lambo was going to do it. And it's, it just falls short. It's like, I just want rest. And I, and I look at this, I'm like, do you want to be healed? The implications of trying Jesus on for size and, and in a, in a really interesting sense going, he already is infinite intelligence. But the beauty of the creation is the fact that it's not just for you to go your own way. It's actually a partnership in which the very purpose that you are created is, is realized. And that's amazing. That's what I want to do. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for reminding us. That's what I want to do, too. Hope you have a great weekend. It's that time. It's the holiday season. So enjoy. Um, and, and folks, just, I think, a great practice. Like, Am I making decisions that are in the nature and character of God himself? And what did he say? I wrote this down. 
what did what did Steve say? Decisions are the seeds of reality's harvest. What decisions am I going to make? And how are they going to grow into this harvest? And is it good harvest or is it an evil harvest? It's interesting. So, folks, thanks again. What a wonderful time with Steve Staggs. 31 of them. It's a lot of time. I'm excited about it. Take care of yourself. And don't mess with Texas. Take care, everybody.